All right, so uh, in this video, I'm going to talk about uh, this method here, uh, temporal difference learning for model predictive control. Um, I'm going to assume you've, you've read the paper, uh, and then I'm going to assume on top of that that reading the paper was not enough to fully understand it. I know this was the case for me. I had to read the paper a couple times, code it up, uh, and work with it quite a lot to come to a point where I feel like I could explain it uh, if on the spot if asked, and I, I understand it well. Uh, so then in this video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the key concepts uh, that, uh, that will help you understand what's going on, uh, because there's a lot going on, and I think maybe pointing out the key concepts will help you like build that mental model of what's happening. Okay, so before diving into exactly how TDMPC works, I just want to lay out the problem formulation just so that we're all on the same page but i am assuming that you are kind of familiar with how rl works uh at least the basics so this shouldn't be news to you it's just making sure that we're, we're we're using the same terms and thinking about the same concepts so the idea is that i have um let's just say i have a task uh i, I want to push a cube into a goal region and then you know in order to do that i need the environment in which to do that so i have a tabletop uh, and I have a blue cube, say, uh, and I have a goal region highlighted on the table. Uh, and in order to enact the pushing of the cube, I need something. So like I'm going to use a robot, uh, robot arm. Um, and the robot arm has all these motors, which are, which, you know, joints, which you can control the angle of. Um, so the uh, the first thing to consider here uh, to to think of the reinforcement learning uh, formalism is we need time steps, uh, so discrete steps in time in which I can apply a, a robot action and see what happens next. So let's just say, for instance, that the robot's working on a twenty hertz control loop. So every fifty milliseconds, I need to provide it with the next next command, um, and then so. Time step zero will be at zero seconds, time step one will be at 50 milliseconds, time step two will be at 100 milliseconds, and so on. Um, so uh, one, one of the ingredients we need here is the, uh, we need to make an observation of the uh, environment at a given point in time, so say time zero, uh, and we'll call that state at time zero. Uh, and what we observe is really up to us and what, what tools we have to uh, at our disposal to make observations with. Uh, a simple setup would be just to just point a camera at this scenario. And so the, the state is just the, all the pixels that make up the a single camera frame. Um, uh, but you can go further and actually just use a computer vision module, for instance, and get the uh, pose of this cube, and that can be a state. And you can read off the uh, angles of these motors, and that can be incorporated into your state as well. Uh, and then the next thing we need to consider is like an action. Um, so just for this example, think of like that this has like a controller board attached to it. And what we're supposed to send in here is differential angular targets for these, these, um, uh, these joints. Uh, so say, let's say a joint at, at, at 45 degrees, uh, there we are, uh, or 90 degrees, we might say plus five degrees and it would do that or minus five degrees and it would do that. Um, and, uh, obviously it doesn't make sense to just say plus 90 degrees because then the robot will just uh, it won't be able to move that fast in 50 milliseconds. So we need to provide like a, a sequence of actions that will move this, this arm gradually to the cube. So the first action we provide, and then uh, 50 milliseconds later, probably the robot's in a different place because we've asked it to move a little bit. So we'll have a different state and it'll be state at time one. And then you, you provide action one and we get the state at time two, provide action two, get the state at time three and so on until you complete the episode uh, and so the, the, and like, a you know, a series of, of states and actions, uh, from start to completion of, a, uh, completion of a task is, is called an episode. And, uh, and then, so you end up in state N and you don't produce an action N because the cube's already in the goal region. Uh, and there may have been other reasons that the, that the episode terminated. Maybe there was a boundary, like an invisible boundary around the whole, uh, setup. And if the robot moved outside of that boundary, it would uh, it would terminate the episode, but with a failure. Right? Um, now, there's no concept of success or failure exactly uh, in in the RL formalism. You just have reward. 
So if the cube ends up in the, 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 the desired region, we can call that success for our own bookkeeping purposes. But for RL, we have to say, well, it's, it's like a, it's a positive reward. It's a good thing. And uh, so what we end up getting, so at each time step, we have to be able to figure out what the reward is. And we will have some sort of like uh, way of calculating that. And so we might use our computer vision module and look at where the cube is. And if it's in the, the, the goal region, we'll give a positive reward. So that's here, right? Um, but at each step, we can give a reward um, that, that's meaningful, or we can give a reward that's meaningless, like as a reward of zero, uh, because we just don't want to calculate, like maybe we just want a simple system that would calculate, okay, is, if the cube is in the goal region, give a positive reward. Or we could have a more complicated system that goes, well, the closer the cube is to the goal region, then we give more reward. Um, okay, so, uh, but in the end, the goal is always to maximize the sum of rewards. So this quantity here, which is the return, it's called. Uh, so G, the return, is the sum of the rewards. We want to maximize that. Uh, and um, I think I think these are all the ingredients we need to, to move forward. This is the problem formulation. Now, um, let's start talking about uh, TDMPC. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is talk about the MPC part of TDMPC. Uh, MPC stands for Model Predictive Control. And uh, this is what TDMPC does at uh, inference time, at rollout time. Uh, and the reason I'm, I want to do it in this order rather than talk about the training first is because I think this will help you understand what new, like which neural networks are required to make the, the machinery of MPC work uh, for us. And then we can go back to, okay, how do you train those? So generally with MPC, what you want to do is given like your environment is like in some sort of state, uh, you want to make a quick deliberation of what sequence of actions for some sort of fixed horizon. So say, say we pick horizon equals five, right? And we want to, we want to figure out what sequence of actions, action t, uh, time t all the way to action at time t plus four. So that's uh, five actions worth. will um, maximize some value that we care about. Uh, and a sensible value to pick, for instance, could be the rewards. So state at time t and action at time t gives you a reward at time t plus one, and also a state at time t plus one. And then state at time t plus one and action at time t plus one gives you a reward at time t, uh, time t plus two, and so on and so on. So you can sum all these rewards up over this, this horizon. And say you have a way of being able to give uh, an estimate for what the return of the rest of the episode will be after uh, doing action t plus four in state t plus four, uh, even better because now you don't only have an, like, an estimate of how good the trajectory on its own is, but you also have an estimate of how good the trajectory is in the global sense of your whole episode. Uh, and we'll come back to, to that in a moment. So the, yeah, so with MPC, uh, importantly, is that you have some objective that you're trying to maximize uh, by by uh, varying these actions, and then you actually only perform the first action, and then after that, when you end up in state uh, at time t plus one, well, you don't think about these actions anymore or any of these predictions anymore because now you do the MPC procedure again for a horizon of five again, uh, and you do that over and over each time, and that's called receding horizon control just to give you another term that you may have seen in the literature. Uh, okay, so that's, I think, uh, the, a general depiction of how MPC works. And now just like more specifically about how that's integrated into TDMPC is, okay, so what, what do we need to do this optimization? So we need, and remember, we, we, we can't actually just roll, these, roll this out and, and let it happen and measure the reward because we need to do all this, we need to do this optimization within a single time step. So if like uh, the control loop is 20 Hertz, we have 50 milliseconds to figure this out. What's the optimal sequence of actions, right? So we need to kind of model this instead of actually do it. So uh, what we need is, first of all, a dynamics model. Uh, or you may have heard of this as a, a world model, but what that takes as input is a state and an action, and it gives you what the next state would be, right? Um, we also need, to predict what the rewards would be. So we need a reward model. So that takes a state and an action and predicts what the next uh, reward would be. 
Uh, and so, and then finally, so, so what you do is you, you run this in a loop. You, you start with state T, which is given to you, right? Uh, and an action, which is kind of given to you because you said, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try out this action and see what happens. And you end up with state time T plus one. And then you plug that into the, into the next step. So then you would compute, oops, you would compute dynamics state at time t plus one, action t plus one, right? Uh, and so on. And so you'd roll, you'd roll this out like with your neural networks essentially rather than using a real experiment. Uh, and you end up getting all four of your rewards, uh, one, two, three, four. And then you can even predict, so you can predict with a Q, uh, with state action value function, uh, given state at time t plus four, what, what your dynamics model predicted, and action at time t plus four, uh, you can predict essentially the return, right? So the expected return uh, afterwards, thereafter. So you would take that and add it onto here, so g t plus four. Um, which reminds me, I kind of want to talk about, you know, why are we doing, like, why are we picking a horizon? Like, why don't we just pick, okay, what's the action that's going to maximize the reward at this point in time? And this is actually one of those fundamental questions and challenges in reinforcement learning is how do you, how do you trade off uh, short-term rewards for, for long, long-term return? And just to illustrate that with a simple example, say we have this 2D world here uh, and we have like a goal that an agent needs to get to by, you know, it can move around left, right, up, down. Uh, and there's also obstacles. So there's this wall here. It's bad if the agent runs into the wall. Maybe we don't want it to run into the wall because it could like you know, cause damage to the robot. Like maybe this is a robot. So we'll give like a negative reward if it runs into the wall. It's really good if it reaches the goal. That's what we want it to do. We'll give it a positive reward for that. And now uh, you can imagine how an RL algorithm might play out as uh, so the agent would kind of explore the environment and move around randomly. And eventually it, it would hit the wall a couple of times because it's quite close to the wall already, figure out that that's a bad thing to do uh, and keep away from the walls. And eventually it might stumble across, uh, upon the goal and then it would figure out, yeah, that's a good thing to, that's a good place to be. Uh, and it would work its way backwards from that and kind of backfill like, Okay, well, here's a pretty good place to be because I'm close to this really positive reward. And here's a pretty good place to be because I'm close to this place, which is close to the positive reward and so on. Okay, but the problem with all this is that you're kind of relying on the agent just stumbling upon this goal in the first place. In two-dimensional space, this could take a while. In three-dimensional, high-dimensional space, it'll take a really long time. So you probably need to add... So this is called a sparse reward where there's only a reward at like the end of the episode or in certain places we we could we need to densify the reward somehow so provide some sort of signal to the agent to tell that it's doing well along the way uh so yeah considering the uh so one example sorry would be uh let's look at the distance between the agent and the goal uh and take the negative of that distance and that means that the further the agent is from the goal the more negative the reward is so being close to the goal is good and i'm talking about the direct beeline distance like like a straight line distance um, because it's an easy to compute heuristic for instance. And uh, this would work for most of most of the way. So like if this is the optimal trajectory between the agent and the goal, then most of the time starting from around uh, here-ish, um, that portion of the reward is always increasing, right? So it's, it's a good reward signal to use, uh, but as you can see, it can be a little bit misleading at, po at points in time. So if this agent was really myopic, and was designed to try to like in, um, optimize for reward one step at a time. The first thing that it would do uh, is move this way, which is the you know beeline distance uh, beeline towards the the goal, and it would end up you know hitting the wall. And then it would have to move around the edges of the wall, or somehow discover that coming back down this way is a good thing in the long term, which would require you know a lot of exploration time potentially. Uh, depending on how you trade off exploration and exploitation. Um, but, you know, getting a bit bit too deep into those details right now, the point is that I want you to see that um, optimizing for one action for one step at a time is not necessarily a good idea. 
and in fact, optimizing for the whole trajectory from start to finish of the episode is probably the best idea if you didn't have other concerns around, well, now is the optimization space too large for me to find a solution in? Uh, and do I have enough compute to do this? And do I have enough compute to do this in time? So that's why you pick a kind of finite horizon. Um, and then the other um, aspect is, okay, so why do we have this final, like like I mentioned uh, like a moment ago, so we have this reward function, which tries to predict the reward at each step, but at the end, we also try to predict the, the value. Uh, we try to predict the expected return. And so if we have a model that can do this fairly accurately, it means we kind of, uh, it, it's kind of a proxy to being able to optimize for the whole like episode trajectory in one go. But there I'll just add the caveat that you're heavily leaning on the ability of your training loop and your neural network to actually learn an accurate estimate here. So now I'm just gonna to try to zoom out a little bit here because there's a, there's a lot going on with all these different models. And what we can actually do is we can bundle up all of this. So this is the idea of recursively taking this dynamics function and like rolling out the, the, the state given your actions uh, and also getting the reward from that and eventually also computing the uh, expected return at the end. Uh, and so I'm going to wrap all this up into like something just, I'm just going to call it Y, right? Uh, so the sum of all these rewards and the, the expected return. And this whole thing here, I'm going to wrap it up into, I'm just going to call it the objective function. And so everything that happens inside this is in this objective function. Uh, so that takes as input the action at time t all the way to time t plus four, right? And, the, and then uh, that gives you uh, Y. And actually I can even make it so, and why is it scale? I can make this simpler and take all these actions and just like concatenate them all into like one long vector and I'll call that X, right? So we're trying to figure out how to vary X in order to, to uh, maximize Y. And I glossed over something before because I said, uh, let just pick some random actions. So the question now is um, how do you actually optimize this action sequence? And you know, what do you, what do you, what do you pick to start with? And um, because I've, I've set it up like this, I'm going to make it really easy and give you an easy example. I'll say, uh, I'll, I'll move away from this example where X is, 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 a, is a vector. And I'll just say, okay, let's consider uh, a situation where the objective function uh, is just uh, a function of a scalar and it gives you a scalar. And we're going to think of a simple physics experiment. Uh, and this is like, so this is the ground and this is a pipe with a little spring loaded into it. And there's a ball there and I can vary one thing. So the, the spring, um, every time I pull back on the spring and let it go, the ball has the same exit velocity. Uh, I can't, I can't be variable about that. And there's this angle that I can vary the theta. And let's say I can, I can vary it between zero and 180 degrees. Uh, and I, let's just say I know very little about physics or nothing about physics. And I just don't know the answer to the question. How do I get the ball to land as far across to the right as possible? And, and most of us know the answer to that is, is set this up at 45 degrees. Um, but uh, we'll ignore that we know that for now. We'll, we'll ignore that we even know that if you set it up to an angle more than 90 degrees, the ball won't even go to the right. right? We'll just, we'll just uh, completely ignore that. And actually, so I can draw that, what that looks like. Um, because it's, I think it goes to sine 2 theta, the distance that the ball goes from, the, um, from, uh, from its launch point. So... Um, if this is, uh, say, uh, 180 degrees here, and this is 90 degrees, oh, do I want to do? Yeah, 90 degrees, and uh, 45 degrees here. So we know, and I'll just draw it here, but like, we know as like outsiders, but like, let's just pretend we don't know. And I'm just going to draw what we know as outsiders, which is that um, this is the function uh, that ties the angle uh, theta, or our x here, to the distance, and I'll just call that y right, um, to the distance that the ball ends up going. Now, um, I'm going to talk to you now about the cross entropy method, which is what TDMPC uses to do the optimization I mentioned above. And I'm going to show you how we would do it in this case, right? So we would, um, so first thing we're going to do is we're going to make a, an initial guess. And we're going to say, well, we know nothing, so we might as well guess that the answer to our question is 90 degrees. 
And then we'll say, and we're quite uncertain about that. So we'll uh, draw a Gaussian distribution to, to represent that. And it'll be a wide one. We just don't, we don't know exactly where it is. Or we have no idea really. It's a super wide Gaussian distribution over the range of interest. And then what we'll have is a hyperparameter called number of samples. And that's going to be fixed throughout the experiment, uh, throughout the algorithm. Uh, say it's 20. And what we'll say is let's randomly draw 20 samples from this distribution. So it'll be denser around the middle, of course. And then we are going to run the experiment for each of these points. So we're going to set this to, we're going to take this angle here, which is maybe 30 degrees. We're going to set this angle up at 30 degrees and fire the ball off, see where it lands and measure the answer uh, of where it lands. And then we're going to plot that. And it might not land exactly on the real curve just because there's error in the way we run the experiment, but that's okay. Most of them, most of the uh, experiments will run, will land roughly near the curve, which remember, we don't actually know about as the people running the experiment. Um, and then what we're going to do with these is we're going to pick another, so we have another hyperparameter, number of elites. It needs to be less than the number of samples. And let's just say it's five. And we say, let's pick the five best in terms of our score y points from our experiments and forget about all the others. And we're going to use these to recompute or compute the parameters of a new Gaussian distribution. So we'll take the average of all these. And in fact, the minor detail is it's a weighted average weighted by the, the y, right? of all of these and that will be our new kind of guess for where the correct answer is and maybe say this is 50 degrees and um and then we'll take the standard deviation also in a weighted manner and that should be give you a narrower gaussian distribution as well now that was one iteration of the outermost loop of this algorithm uh, and we have another parameter called the number of iterations which we might set to some number like say five and so the next iteration would look like this. You draw 20 samples again from this Gaussian distribution now, and you'd run 20 experiments again, and you'd pick your five elites. And there would the new mean that you get from that would probably be closer to uh, the, the correct answer of 45 degrees. So maybe, I don't know, it would be 46, right? Uh, and so you, you can and you can see how that's the case. Um, just to doubly be sure that you know, that's clear. It's because you're drawing more samples here near to the um, real answer, right? And you're drawing less samples out here. So it's, uh, so the, so the elites that you end up picking are going to be more tightly clustered uh, near the correct answer. Uh, so yeah, you run that for five iterations and probably in the end, what you get is 45 degrees with a, with a tight standard deviation. You don't need to worry too much about the standard deviation now because all you need to care about is the mean. That's your answer that you care about. Okay, so this I, I, I've made like an, an abstraction and made a simple problem, but now you can probably tie this back to um, our actual problem with the DMPC. So I tried to make X into a scalar. Let's go back to X being multidimensional and X actually being represented as the vectors that make up our action sequence vectors because maybe our motor, our robot has multiple motors, right? And so say that our robot has six motors, then each of these vectors has six elements and there are five vectors uh, for the whole sequence. So that's 30, 30 uh, elements in total um, for the X uh, vector. And so we have a 30 dimensional Gaussian that we sample from. Uh, and we can, we can set things up with our uh, with our modeling such that, you know, these actions are normalized to be in the range minus one to one. And then from there, it kind of makes sense to pick like a standard normal distribution uh, as your initial starting uh, distribution. And so you sample your first set of actions from this uh, multidimensional Gaussian distribution. And then as I explained before, you end up running this loop where you're computing the, you know, the whole rollout of states and rewards using your neural network models that you've trained from before. Now note how this is actually different from my simple physics example here, 
where I actually ran the experiment, the real experiment. Um, here, we did not actually roll out the actions on the robot and check what the reward was. We neurally simulated it with our dynamics model and our reward model and our uh, Q value function. So, uh, and, th and this is because we have to be able to do this 20 hertz control loop, we have to do this in less than 50 milliseconds, right? And then get the first action and then run that first action and then observe the new state and do everything again. So just to summarize all that, what MPC does, uh, what we're doing is we're trying to find a, a good action trajectory over a finite horizon. And we're doing that using the cross entropy method. Uh, and the cross entropy method requires you to propose uh, an, an action trajectory and then have a way of being able to predict based on that what some objective uh, uh, value would be, right? And what we do to do that is, is we, we sample an action trajectory from uh, multiple action trajectories from a Gaussian distribution, and we neurally roll out that action trajectory uh, while also predicting the reward and the final expected return. And summing up the reward and uh, final expected return, uh, you get uh, your objective value that you want to optimize for. And then so you plug and chug that through the machinery of the cross entropy method uh, and then end up getting your estimate for the uh, optimal action sequence. So I think that will do for this video and I'm just gonna split it up into parts. Um, but the question you hopefully have in your mind right now is, okay, well, we relied on uh, some neural networks to estimate some things. How do, we, how do we actually train those neural networks up? And that's what I'll be focusing on in the next part of, the, of this series.